And today we are taking you to the South Pool of the 9-11 Memorial. This is part two of our September 11th series. So if you want to watch the North Pool documentary, you can find the video linked below. Before we get started, please make sure you like this video and you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It really helps us a lot. Also, feel free to share in the comments how 9-11 affected you. We always like to learn more about our viewers. And with that, let's get started. Just like we've seen at the North Pool, the South Pool also features a dedicated section for all victims that died on the United Airlines Flight 175. This is the plane that was deliberately flown into the South Tower. And just like American Airlines Flight 11, the plane that hit the North Tower, United Airlines Flight 175 originated from Boston and took off at 8.14 a.m. It was destined to arrive in Los Angeles. However, at around 8.47, air traffic control indicated that they may believe that the plane was hijacked which sadly turned out to be true. At 9.02 and 59 seconds, approximately 17 minutes after American Airlines Flight 11 hit the North Tower, United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower between the 77th and 85th floor. On board were 51 innocent passengers and nine crew members. Among the passengers that died on United Airlines Flight 11 were Mark Bavis, an American Hockey League left winger, and the youngest 9-11 victim, Christine Lee Hansen, who was only two and a half years old. And here you can see her name, Christine Lee Hansen, along with her parents' names, Sue and Peter. Christine's beloved Peter Rabbit stuffed animal was later donated to the 9-11 Memorial Museum by her grandparents. Now we cross into the dedicated panels for all first responders of the New York City Fire Department. In total, 343 firefighters died on September 11. While everyone was fleeing out of the buildings, these brave heroes made their way up to the towers with heavy gear to rescue people. But what's noteworthy is that 9-11 took more first responder lives than those who died on September 11. It is estimated that in 2023, more than 300 firefighters, emergency service technicians, officers and paramedics died from 9-11 related illnesses such as lung cancer. It is believed that the post 9-11 related deaths may soon surpass the number of those who died on September 11. In our North Pole video, we played a clip that showed how uncertain people were about what had happened. At the time American Airlines Flight 11 hit the North Tower, many were unsure whether it was an accident or not. Unlike today, where news and images are captured at all times of the day and live streamed, all you had in 2001 were witness reports about a plane hitting the North Tower but that was really it. However, once the North Tower was on fire, all cameras were turned onto the Twin Towers and opinions quickly changed when United Airlines Flight 175 flew into the South Tower. It was at that moment, even though unconfirmed, everyone knew this was a terrorist attack. Listen to this news report to hear live commentary from September 11, 2001 the moment United Airlines Flight 175 hit the South Tower. So you have no idea right, right oh, now? Oh, there's another one. Another plane just hit. 
right. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. Another plane has just hit. It hit another building. Oh. Flew right into the middle of it. Oh. Explosion. Oh my God. It's right in the middle of the building. This one into the east tower. Yes. Yes. Right in the middle of the building. It, and right now, that, yes, that was definitely looked like it was on purpose. You saw a yes, plane? Yes, I just saw a plane go into the building. Why do you say that was definitely on purpose? It, because it just, it just flew straight into it. It looks like it's about, uh, I would say 15 floors lower than the first building. Do have some videotape uh -oh. of the second plane, and you can oh. see it there. Oh. Where? Oh. I didn't see it. Here, oh, look whoa! Oh, oh, my this God. Is crazy. We We're under attack. Going into and building. And from our vantage point, yeah, clearly difficult to tell. We're under uh, attack. What type of plane that is? But it's a horrific scene. That's and oh all right. We've just been told God. also, Michael. Sorry, the New York Stock Exchange is, is being evacuated, as is, I'm sure, much of Wall Street, <gasps> if not all of it, as, as much as possible. But the New York Stock Exchange has suspended trading for the moment. It's war. As I mentioned earlier in this video, United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower shortly before 9:03 a.m. 17 minutes after the North Tower was struck by American Airlines Flight 11. In total, more people died in the North Tower than in the South Tower. And that's simply because the people in the North Tower had no warning about what was about to happen. And while many people in the South Tower were able to evacuate in those 17 minutes, a lot of employees remained inside the South Tower. Now, you may be wondering why is that? A lot of people remained inside the building not only to shelter from the falling debris of the North Tower, but also because they were reassured by a public announcement system that the situation was not affecting the South Tower. Here are a few quotes from survivors who recount the public announcements. Quote, they told us there was an accident in Tower 1, that the fire department was on its way, that our building was secure and safe, and that we could return to our offices shortly. Another survivor remembers, quote, they kept saying, repeat, building 2 is secure. Repeat, building 2 is secure. A number of people did turn around. Lastly, a third survivor remembers the following public announcement. Quote, Stay where you are. This is a secure area. Please remain in the building. Stay where you are. This announcement had led to many workers returning to their offices, thinking they were safe. Only a minute before United Airlines Flight 175 flew into the South Tower, they changed the announcement and ordered an evacuation of the building. Too late for those who remained in good faith within the South Tower. We are still looking at the panels dedicated to New York firefighters. And while doing so, we also wanted to mention the four-legged heroes, also known as the dogs of 9-11, that accompanied firefighters and police on their mission to spot survivors that may be trapped. And while no survivors were found, the dogs still helped recover bodies in the wreckage of the World Trade Center. More than 300 dogs were deployed in the search and recovery efforts. Among them, a German Shepherd called Apollo, a Golden Retriever named Riley, and a Labrador Retriever named Guinness. Only one police dog named Sirius died in the attacks. On that note, there were also two guide dogs, both Labrador Retrievers, that were with their owners in the North Tower Upon impact of American Airlines Flight 11, they led their blind owners to safety from the 71st 
and 78th floor respectively. Their names were Salty and Roselle. A few more insights into the FDNY. If you watched our video about the North Tower, you may recall our note about the only clear footage of the first plane hitting the North Tower came from a French producer team who was supposed to capture the day-to-day -day life of a New York firefighter. At the time, they were with members of Letter Company 1, Engine 7, who were also first responders on the scene on September 11. The firefighters were under the direction of Chief Joseph Pfeiffer, who lost his brother on that day, Engine 33 Lieutenant Kevin Pfeiffer. His name can be seen around the 7th minute and 30 seconds mark. If you've ever visited the 9-11 Museum, you may remember seeing a badly crushed, burned and melted fire truck. If you don't know what we're talking about, we strongly recommend you visit the 9-11 Museum to see the truck in person. It is a truly impressive sight and shows just how far the destruction caused by the terrorist attacks reached beyond the Twin Towers. The truck was recovered from Ground Zero and belonged to members of the FDNY Ladder Company 3. A panel on the fire truck reads, Jeff, we will not forget you, which relates to Jeffrey John Giordano, a member of 11 Ladder Company 3 who died along with Captain Patrick Patty John Brown and others on September 11. Jeff's and Patty's names can be seen side by side around the 4 minute and 22 seconds mark. By now we crossed into the panels dedicated to the victims of the New York Police Department. And here we can see the name of the only female NYPD officer who died in the South Tower on 9-11, Maura Ann Smith. You can see it here at the top of the panel, Maura Ann Smith. Many survivors remember Maura leading them out of the South Tower to safety. Her last message was a cry for help from other officers over the police radio, reporting that she was trapped in the building. The transmission stopped when the second tower fell. In total, 23 members of the NYPD died on September 11. However, just like anyone else who was in or near the Twin Towers on that fateful day, many more died over the last 22 years because of 9-11 related illnesses. Nearly 300 members of the NYPD who were directly involved in search and recovery efforts on and after September 11, 2001 have died so far. Unfortunately, their names may never be captured on the memorial. Speaking of 9-11 related illnesses, Many people have suffered from immediate respiratory issues, while others would deal with long-term lung conditions after September 11. Over the next 10 to 20 years, many survivors developed lung cancer due to the toxic dust which contained asbestos, a known carcinogen, lead and mercury that they inhaled and or swallowed. However, the most common cancers directly related to 9-11 were and are skin cancer, thyroid cancer, and prostate cancer. Many men were also diagnosed with male breast cancer, which is generally rare. While in particular first responders and tower survivors battle these illnesses, it was also reported that many people, residents, students and office workers in nearby neighborhoods such as Chinatown developed serious health issues that could be directly tied to the attacks. Apart from physical illnesses, 
Many survivors suffer from mental health issues such as PTSD, also called post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and what is known as survivor guilt. Among those, some started to self-medicate themselves and developed a substance use disorder. This mental health crisis is not often discussed, but a report from 2021 suggests that a significant number of people who died of suicide were directly exposed to 9-11 and were, for example, first responders, an immediate family member of a victim, or a survivor. We are now approaching the panels dedicated to the victims who worked in the South Tower on September 11. It starts with the victims who worked on the floors that were hit by United Airlines Flight 175. The plane's impact zone was between the 77th and 85th floors. These floors were occupied by a number of financial institutions such as Fuji Bank, which used to be a major Japanese bank, Euro Brokers on the 84th floor, and attorneys Harris Beach and Wilcox on the 85th floor. The first story we want to share is the story of Randy Scott. And you can see his name right here, Randolph Scott, on the upper left corner, Randolph Scott. Randy worked at Euro Brokers on the 84th floor in the South Tower. While his family believed for many years that Randy instantly died upon the impact of United Airlines Flight 175, a note found on the street told a different story. Apparently, Randy threw the note out of the window in an effort to let people know that he, along with other co-workers, were trapped on the 84th floor and that they needed help. The note contained a blood stain, which was later analyzed, and 10 years later it was confirmed to be Randy's blood. I placed the note in the upper right corner of the screen. Unfortunately, Randy never made it out of the South Tower. The note was later handed to Randy's family. Just like the North Tower, few people who were on the floors that were directly impacted by United Airlines Flight 175 or on the floors above the impact zone were able to escape the South Tower. As discussed earlier, those who made it out were and are haunted by the event. Many tried to cope by joining networks to connect with survivors. In 2007, a major scam was revealed by the New York Times about a woman who claimed since 2004 to have been a survivor of the attacks on the World Trade Center. The woman, who introduced herself as Tanya Head, claimed that she was working at Merrill Lynch on the 78th floor in the South Tower when United Airlines Flight 175 hit the building. As a reminder, the impact zone of United Airlines Flight 175 was between the 77th and 85th floors. Tanya went on to fabricate a whole story of how she escaped the South Tower with her arm hanging by a piece of skin and how she lost her husband Dave in the North Tower. Her story became one of the key survivor stories of 9-11. Later, it was revealed that Merrill Lynch had no record of her employment, nor did they have offices in the World Trade Center at the time of the attacks. Further digging uncovered that the family of Dave never heard of Tanya, whose name was also fake. Her real name is Alicia Esteve Hitt. Finally, after the story gained traction, it was discovered that her arm was injured during a car accident in Barcelona. Speaking of Barcelona, and to sum that story up, Tanya was never a U.S. citizen or resident, nor was she in Manhattan on September 11, 2001. She was in Barcelona, Spain, where she lived prior to visiting New York for the first time in 2003. If you want to learn more, there is an interesting documentary available on YouTube called The Woman Who Wasn't There. 
Tanya has since left New York City and is now conducting business in Barcelona. If you watched our documentary of the North Pole, you may remember our comment about the corners of the memorial pools. The corners are always busy, as you can see here. This is because you can get really nice pictures of the pool with the World Trade Center in the background. It was a real challenge to capture the names of the victims on those corners. But after all, I think we were successful. As a reminder, if you want to watch the North Pole documentary, you can find the link to the video in the description. Unlike American Airlines Flight 11, which was directed straight into the central core of the North Tower, and by that, severing all escape paths, United Airlines Flight 175 hit the South Tower bank to the left. It is believed that this maneuver was initiated as the plane may have otherwise missed or just scraped the South Tower. As a result of the angled impact, a single stairwell was still accessible across 110 floors. However, only 18 people were able to navigate past the impact zone and rush to safety. One of those people was Stanley Pramnath, an executive with Fuji Bank on the 81st floor of the South Tower. Incidentally, he was also one of the many people who were on their way out of the second tower shortly after the North Tower was hit, but returned to their offices after being reassured by a public announcement system that the situation was not affecting the South Tower. Stan witnessed United Airlines Flight 175 flying towards the building, banked to the left at high speed. After the impact, Stanley's floor was mostly demolished. However, he was able to escape with the help of Brian Clark, an executive of Eurobrokers on the 84th floor. They made their way out of the South Tower just in time by using the only available staircase. Now, we mostly talked about the tenants that were directly located on the floors that were impacted by United Airlines Flight 175. However, many more companies within the South Tower lost hardworking employees on September 11. Right above the impact zone, from the 86th to the 110th floors, were further financial institutions such as Fiduciary Trust Company International on the 94th to 97th floors, Aon Corporation, a management consulting firm on the 98th through 105th floors, and Atlantic Bank of New York on the 106th floor. Right below the impact zone was Morgan Stanley with offices on the 59th through 74th floors. Other companies on the lower levels in the South Tower were Guy Carpenter, Oppenheimer Funds, and Verizon. Since it's getting a little dark now, we want to remind you that every year, from dusk to dawn on the night of September 11, you can find the Tribute in Light art installation in Lower Manhattan. The two blue beams are located on top of a parking garage in Battery Park and on clear nights, the lights can be seen from 60 miles or 97 kilometers away. The art installation both honors those killed on September 11 and also afterwards those who died of 9-11 related illnesses and celebrates the unbreakable spirit of New York. If you want to visit the lights in downtown Manhattan, be prepared for crowds. If September 11 should be a clear night, we recommend watching the Tribute in Light art installation from another, less crowded spot. 
As mentioned in our North Pole documentary, the 9-11 memorial is open every day from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We started capturing all names at the North Pole around 7 p.m. and later on headed to the South Pole, where we are right now. Unfortunately, we didn't make it around the South Pole in time and were asked to leave at 8 p.m. That's why you will see a little more daylight in the next section of this video as we return to the South Pole the next day around 7 p.m. to capture the rest of the panels. So we return the next evening and now look at the single trail of jet exhaust in the sky. Kind of eerie how it almost looks like it's going through the upper floors of the World Trade Center. Now pay attention to the next panel right here. At the bottom we can see Melissa Doy's name. 32-year-old Melissa was born in New York and lived with her mother in the Bronx. She worked at IQ Financial Systems on the 83rd floor of the South Tower and was directly within the impact zone of United Airlines Flight 175. However, you may recall that not everyone within the South Tower's impact zone died instantaneously. And so, Melissa was still alive after United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into her floor. Alive, but trapped. Melissa left behind an emotional, but very important conversation with 911 emergency operator Vanessa Barnes, whom she reached at 9.17 a.m., 14 minutes after the plane sliced through the building. This exchange lasted 24 minutes and was later played by prosecutors during the trial of a member of Al-Qaeda who pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit the attacks. During the call, Melissa begs for help for her and five others she was trapped with and shares how hot it is and that her floor is engulfed in smoke and that everybody is having trouble breathing. What is not captured on the recording is Melissa's message to her mom, Evelyn, which she asked the 911 operator to pass on. Her message was, quote, tell my mother that I love her and that she's the best mom in the whole world. We are now going to play part of Melissa's conversation with 911 operator Vanessa Barnes. Just a heads up that some individuals may find this recording upsetting and or distressing. If you want to skip this section, pause here and check out the timestamps in the description to move on to the next chapter of your choice. Good morning. Have a good day. Hi, what's your number again, please? 865. Oh, I'm on the 83rd floor. floor. I'm on the 83rd floor. 865. 865. She had the world trade system. Someone having difficulty breathing on the 83rd floor. Okay, ma'am. How are you doing? Is it, is it, is it, are they going to be able to get somebody up here? Well, of course, ma'am. We're coming up to you. Well, there's no one here yet, and the floor is completely engulfed. We're on the floor, and we can't breathe. Okay. And it's very, very, very hot. It's very, is it, are the lights still on? The lights are on, but it's very hot. Ma'am, ma'am. Very that. hot. We're all the way on the other side of Liberty. And it's very, very hot. Are you lights, did you could turn the lights off? No. No, the lights are off. Okay, good. Now, everybody stay calm. You're doing a good job. Please. Ma'am, listen. Damn it. Everybody's coming. Everybody knows. Everybody knows what happened, okay? Yeah. Hey, but no, no, they have to take time to come up here, you know that. got to be very careful. It's very hot. I understand. you got to be very, very careful how they approach you, okay? All right? So when they come up here, it won't be worse than it is. Uh, now, you stay calm. And so how many people where you're at right now? There's like five people here with me. All up from the 83rd floor? 83rd floor. With five people. Five patients. Everybody's having trouble breathing? Everybody's having trouble breathing. Some people are worse. You know, some people are unconscious. unconscious. Everybody's awake? So far, yes. But it's uh, really listen, listen. Everybody's awake? Yes, so far. Conscious. And it's very hot there, but no fire, right? I can't see no, it's no, too it's high. Hot, very hot. No fire for now. And no smoke, right? No smoke, right? Of course there's smoke. Ma'am, ma'am, you have to stay calm. There is smoke. I okay. can't breathe. Okay, you stay calm with me, okay? I understand. I think there is fire because it's very hot. 
Okay. It, it's very hot everywhere on the floor. Okay. I know you don't see it, and I know, but we, I'm going to document. I'm documenting what you say. Okay. And it's very hot. I we see no fire, but you see smoke, right? It's very hot. I see. I don't. I don't okay. see any air anymore. Okay. All I see is smoke. Okay, dear. I'm so sorry. Hold on one. Stay calm with me. Stay calm. Now, Please. To, uh, listen, listen. The call is in. I'm documenting. I'm going to let them... Hold on one second, please. I'm going to die, aren't I? No, 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 no. Say I'm going to die. Ma'am, 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 say your prayers. And we're not going to die. We're going to think positive because you got to help each other get off the floor. I'm now, die. No. You know, stay calm, stay calm, stay calm, stay calm. Oh, God. You're doing a good job, ma'am. You're doing no. a good job. You're it's so job. hot. I'm burning up. Then you, okay. If you don't, the floor is hot and everything is hot. It's, 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 they're all their deaths. When you go up high, you, you get too close away from the smoke. Okay. I know you know. Hold on a second. 83rd floor, three people trapped. Very hot on the 83rd floor. While Melissa's call to 911 was playing, you may have noticed that we were passing a few panels that we couldn't record due to children sitting on top of them. Rest assured, in just a moment we will go back to capture those. However, just letting you know that sitting on the panels is not allowed for obvious reasons. This family was quickly approached by a security guard who asked the moms to remove the little girls from the panels. So, if you're planning on visiting the memorial, make sure you don't sit on the plates. Before we reach the end of this side of the South Pole, we also wanted to share the story of Wells Crowther. His name can be seen around the 28 minute and 47 second mark on panel S50. On September 11, 2001, 24 year old Wells worked as an equities trader at Sandler O'Neill and Partners on the 104th floor. Upon impact of United Airlines flight 175 into the South Tower, Wells, a volunteer firefighter, knew he had to act quickly. After leaving a message for his mom stating that he was okay, he rushed out of his office to the 78th floor sky lobby. The sky lobby was essentially a transfer floor. An express elevator would take you from the main lobby to the 78th floor and from there you were able to switch to elevators that would stop on the upper floors. There, on the 78th floor sky lobby, Wells encountered a group of survivors. Some of them were badly injured. And these survivors were waiting for an elevator to the main lobby. Now, if you've watched this video in full so far, you may remember that a single stairwell was still accessible across all 110 floors in the South Tower. So Wells, coming from the 104th floor, directed the survivors to the only available stairwell. He did the same for another group of survivors he found. And while he selflessly went up and down along firefighters to direct survivors to safety, and also carrying wounded people as far down the South Tower as possible, he himself never made it out alive. It is believed that Wells helped save as many as 18 lives on September 11. Now, you may be wondering how come we know for a fact that it was indeed Wells who saved those people. After the attacks, the New York Times published an interview with a survivor who recounted being saved by a man with a red banana over the mouth and nose. Over the next few months, many more survivors remembered the same man helping them as well and were able to confirm Wells' identity from photographs shown to them. What's also supporting the fact that this man was indeed Wells Crowther is that his mother confirmed that he had carried a red handkerchief since he was a little boy. And that's why Wells is also known as the Man in the Red Bandana. And now to another very tragic story. It's the story of 46-year-old Kevin Cosgrove. 
Kevin worked as a vice president at Aon Corporation on the 105th floor in the South Tower. As a reminder, Aon Corporation had offices on the 98th through 105th floors. These floors were above the impact zone of United Airlines Flight 175. Even though there was a single stairwell accessible across all floors, many people were trapped on various floors. And so was Kevin, his co-worker Doug Cherry, and a third person. At 9.54, 51 minutes after the plane crashed into the South Tower between the 77th through 85th floors, he was able to call a 911 emergency operator. Before we continue, here you can see Kevin Cosgrove's name, along with the co-worker's name who was stuck with Kevin on the 105th floor, Doug Cherry. Now back to the 911 call that Kevin placed on September 11. Just like Melissa Doy's conversation, a recording of Kevin's exchange with the 911 operator was also played in the trial of an Al Qaeda member. During the call to 911, an exhausted Kevin shared that he, Doug, and his other co worker can barely see due to the massive amount of smoke and expressed his concern that he doesn't believe anyone is on their way up to save them. He also said, we are not ready to die, but it's getting bad. The call ends as the South Tower collapses at 9.59 a.m. Just before the call ends though, one can hear the building collapse while Cosgrove is screaming in fear. We are now playing a short audio clip of the conversation between Kevin and the 911 operator. If you want to skip the audio clip, pause here and check out the timestamps in the description to move on to the next chapter of your choice. We're on the 105th floor, the northwest corner, right? Right. At number two, World Trade Center, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's two of us in this office. We're not ready to die, but it's getting bad. Yeah, sure, sure. I understand, sir. We just don't try to get all the people. All the people out there. I'm trying to let them know where you are. As we were moving around the South Pole, you may have noticed a few roses attached to some names. While flowers and notes are frequently placed by family members, the 9-11 Memorial Museum started a wonderful tradition in 2013. Each day they place a white rose at the name of each victim whose birthdays would have been celebrated on that day. These birthday roses are distributed every morning before the memorial opens to the public. The idea came from a volunteer who lost friends and co-workers on September 11, 2001. Likewise, if you see a sea of yellow roses at once, these roses are placed in honor of Veterans Day and to pay tribute to the 9-11 victims who served in the United States military. As we are nearing the end of the South Pole panels dedicated to victims that died within the South Tower, we wanted to share one last fact about United Airlines Flight 175, the plane that crashed into the South Tower at 9.02 and 59 seconds. As mentioned earlier in this video, the flight originated from Boston Logan International Airport and its intended destination was Los Angeles. Back in 2001, airport security was much less strict compared to what we know today. Essentially, everyone was able to enter the airport and walk right up to any gate they wished. All they had to do was pass through a metal detector. If there were safety concerns, further screening was then provided by private security companies that were either hired by the airport or airlines. 
but unfortunately, further screening did not happen for any of the hijackers of United Airlines Flight 175. They proceeded to the gate and boarded the plane. The plane was a Boeing 767-200, a passenger aircraft pretty much as we know it today. The plane took off at 8.14 a.m. Around the same time, American Airlines flight, the plane that crashed into the North Tower, was hijacked. Incidentally, the pilot, 51-year-old Victor Saragini, along with First Officer Michael Herox, were contacted by air traffic controllers and were asked if they could see Flight 11, given they both took off from Boston minutes apart. While the crew on board United Airlines Flight 175 could not locate American Airlines Flight 11, they shared that while climbing out of Logan International Airport, they heard a transmission of someone saying, everyone stay in your seats. Unfortunately, this was also the last transmission of United Airlines Flight 175. At 8.42, the plane was hijacked and nearly caused a mid-air collision with Delta Airlines Flight 2315, flying from Hartford to Tampa, reportedly missing the plane by only 200 feet, or 60 meters. The hijackers then rerouted to New York City, where it ended in the South Tower. While we were sharing some more background information about United Airlines Flight 175, we passed on to the panel that list the names of those victims that died on United Airlines Flight 93 and American Airlines Flight 77. American Airlines Flight 77 originated from Washington Dulles Airport near DC and was bound for Los Angeles. Only 30 minutes after takeoff, hijackers stormed the cockpit and turned the plane around to head back to DC. They crashed the aircraft into the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m., killing the 59 innocent passengers on the plane, along with 231 people that were in and around the Pentagon. Last but not least, we want to share a few notes on United Airlines Flight 93, the only plane that, while successfully hijacked, never hit a target because of its brave passengers. It originated from Newark Airport in New Jersey and was bound for San Francisco, California. Its intended target was the Capitol in Washington, D.C. After it was hijacked, passengers started to unite and to fight the hijackers together in order to regain control of the plane. The group was spearheaded by Todd Beamer, whose name can be seen at the 40 minute and 35 seconds mark. As they were about to breach the cockpit, the hijackers decided to crash the plane into an empty field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. These 40 innocent people on board United Airlines Flight 93 sacrificed their own lives, but saved many others on that fateful day. We are now approaching the last couple of panels on our trip around the South Pole. We hope you found this documentary helpful and that you may have learned one or two new facts about the September 11 terrorist attacks. If so, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and share in the comment section what fact or story surprised you most? You can also find our North Pole documentary on our channel, which you can watch right after you have finished this video. But before we let you go, please make sure you subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. And with that, we'll finish with President Bush's remarks on September 11, 2001. We hope to see you on our channel again next week. Until then, stay safe and see you soon. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, 
military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shattered steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature, and we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C. to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them.